ADHD Rewired, episode 425. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection and you are not alone. Go to ADHDrewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Catherine Lee. Catherine is the director of the Lethbridge Piper and Associates, an Australian occupational health and safety management consultancy. For 30 years, Catherine has advised employers, CEOs, boards, executives, and leadership teams on strategic health and safety management. She holds postgraduate degrees in occupational health and safety management and is a certified occupational health and safety professional. We're going to get into sort of some, some of the curves that your profession, that your, your work has taken, including one that actually led you to your own ADHD diagnosis. Catherine, welcome. Thank you, Eric. It's a privilege to be here. I've listened to your show for quite a while and I've learned so much, so... It's an honor to be here. Oh, well, thank you. So you're doing some really interesting work out there in Australia. You've created the, the Neurodiverse Safe Work Initiative for making work safe, healthy, and inclusive for neurodiverse workers. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's quite the undertaking. Uh, well, it is and it's not. I think um, I'm really still doing what I've always done. Um, in terms of working with my client organizations to support them in creating safe workplaces for their workforce. But I've really just expanded the scope of that to introduce employers to the concept of this big, beautiful world of neurodiversity, which I think most employers really don't have any idea of. I mean, it just, uh, having worked in this space for 30 odd years now, as you said, I could probably up until early 2000, uh, 2020, I could probably count on one hand the number of times I had knowingly dealt with or given any advice about a worker with a neurodivergent condition. So it was very rare for me to come across this and I really knew nothing about it. Um, it w wasn't on my radar. Um, it's, it's, yes, I've actually pivoted my whole business to towards uh, the Neurodiverse Safe Work Initiative now. And as far as I can tell, there's nobody else doing this in the world. I think if I, if there was, I would have found them by now because I've been trying to connect with others because I think when you, you're doing something new, it can be quite isolating, but um, there's nobody else doing this. So um, it's interesting. So you shared with me that uh, sort of the, the backstory to mm. this is that you were working with someone who stopped taking their ADHD meds because yeah. they uh, were going to start getting drug tested. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what happened, Eric, was I, so we all went into lockdown, obviously, with COVID at the beginning of 2020. And I was doing more work, obviously, at home. And at the end, we here in Queensland only had five or six weeks at the start of the COVID pandemic, um, where we were actually in hard lockdown. And after that, we were able to go out again. And so one of the first investigations I was asked to do for empl an employer after we came out of lockdown was of a, a young chap, um, we'll call him Kyle. He had had a fall at work and the employer couldn't figure out why this otherwise seemingly healthy guy had, had fallen. He'd fractured his coccyx. Mm. It was on the back end of a number of other incidents that had occurred in the previous few weeks or months as well as some behavioural changes that the employer had noticed. So he was becoming more erratic at work, more emotionally labile, blowing up at people. They knew there were problems at home. He was making operational errors. He was a production worker. So, you know, he'd made mistakes that had ended up with product being lost and he'd been in trouble for that. And the day before this incident had occurred, 
he'd had a bust up with his supervisor and walked off the job. So he came into work the next day and got a warning from HR because he'd walked off the job, which is, you know, I guess. Yep, absolutely. Reasonable. And then he went back onto the production line and was working there for a little while. And then this fall happened. So I was seeing him a couple of days later and I went out to the workplace and met him there and the employer hadn't been able to get to the root cause. I mean, why had he fallen? And I had a look, did what I normally do, couldn't find any slip or trip hazards. The lighting was good. He was wearing good footwear. Fortunately, there was CCTV footage of the incident. So we, I watched this with him, sat down and talked with him for a couple of hours. We saw what happened. Fortunately, I already knew this chap because I'd done some work with his client before and he'd been involved in some training I'd given. So I had a reasonable relationship with him. I really just took my time in that investigation interview with him to try and really get to the bottom of not just this incident, but what's been going on for you in the last few months. These are the things your employers noticed. And he agreed that the wheels had kind of fallen off for him in the last few months. And it wasn't until that point where we plotted that out that he had a light bulb moment and said, oh, uh, well, I'm just going to tell you this. I haven't told my boss, but I had, past tense, I had ADHD when I was a kid and I was taking Ritalin and everything's been good. Then four months ago, he said the employer introduced a drug and alcohol policy. Now, this hadn't been particularly well introduced by the employer, hadn't been consulted, workers hadn't been um, educated in what it meant. And he got scared because he realized that if he was drug tested at work, his Ritalin would show up and he didn't want to lose his job. He thought he would get busted. He didn't realize that this, you know, it's perfectly legal to take prescription medication drugs of this nature. But the employer hadn't communicated that and they hadn't built in a mechanism into the policy to allow workers to disclose information like this safely and confidentially. Look, he came off his meds. He didn't talk to his doctor. He assumed he'd grown out of his ADHD and just stopped taking it. And of course, then gradually over a period of weeks, those symptoms of ADHD began to return and he wasn't even particularly aware of it at the time. So really this fall at at work, I guess, brought everything into sharp focus for him. And so the effect of that for me was shocking for me. I, I, as I said, I really knew very little about ADHD. It wasn't even on my radar when I was growing up, uh, you know, in the seventies in the UK, ADHD wasn't even talked about, you know, we, we knew nothing about it. So I did what I guess any occupational health professional would do in that situation. And I went off to research it and learn as much as I could. And I thought, well, there's got to be some information out there for employers about managing the safety risks for workers with ADHD, because clearly there are safety risks. Not that the worker is the hazard, but the hazards that exist in the environment for everyone may be perceived differently and experienced differently for people with ADHD. So I went off to read up about it and I was just astonished to find that there was nothing no information at all available for employers specifically about safety for people with ADHD. The further I looked, I mean, I looked at my own regulator in Queensland, I looked in Australia, I looked in my professional body of knowledge, further afield, looked in the US, surely they'd be all over it in the US and Canada and Europe, nothing. Mm. There is lots of information available for people that have ADHD about their own productivity at work. And that's all really good stuff. And there's a whole debate about whether employees um, or people with ADHD should disclose to their employer or not. And really leaning towards not disclosing because of the issues around discrimination and employers just not knowing how to handle that information, but nothing about safety. Mm. And so the more I researched, the more shock, the shocking the information was to me. One of the first um, articles I read actually was an article in an Australian GP newsletter here, uh, an article written by David Coggle, who's the chair of child development and mental health in University of Melbourne, who was basically analysing um, some international research that had been done in 2018 by Rahman et al. about the incidence of ADHD globally. What shocked me by David, David Coggle's reporting on that was that in Australia, of for, for every one person diagnosed with ADHD, there are at least nine others walking around undiagnosed, untreated. And of course, what I also learned was that the long-term health and socioeconomic impacts 
of undiagnosed and untreated ADHD oh, are huge. profound, it's are huge. huge. In Australia, of course, because it's underdiagnosed and undertreated, it's neglected. It's relatively mainly treated within the public health system. So private health, not really available if you're diagnosed as an adult. So, you know, it was just, I felt it was a real, um, I felt the scales falling from my eyes and suddenly there was this whole world opened up before me of risk for workers with neurodivergent challenges in the workplace that is completely unrecognized by employers, by regulators, and therefore unmanaged. And unfortunately, I felt, I feel that it's those workers that are clearly disadvantaged, but the employers are missing out as well, because uh, the whole concept of neurodiversity was d developed by Judy uh, Singer in Australia, um, uh, as, you know, neurodiversity is essential to human functioning as biodiversity is to the environment. So if 30 to 40% of the world's population is neurodivergent, it must be there for a reason. These brains are different and incredible and have incredible gifts and talents that neurotypical brains don't want. So why would we not want to embrace that in the workplace, but do it safely? Mm. I was, uh, I was recently listening to an episode of the podcast uh, On Being with uh, Krista Tippett. Ah. And she was interviewing this guy where he was talking about, you know, for so long in our history, we have a, a lens that we view the world through and it's a deficit lens. Mm. And the argument he was making is like, that's a choice that we've made. Yeah, and that's what, right. And what if we actually look at the world and the people that we interact with in this world through an assets lens. Exactly. Right. And the way he was, he was, he was speaking about it in a little bit of a different way than you would normally hear about it in the kind of the, the coaching and, and the mental health realm. It was like, I think looking at it through the lens of this is a choice, how we view this. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and it really was. It was like instead of looking at the person who needs uh, help breaking down the project, like this is the person who can come up with a thousand ideas. You Absolutely. Know, you know, and More so creative ideas, incredibly creative ideas, you know. And I think this, this situation is the same in workplaces, Eric, because as an occupational health professional, what I've seen and realized now is that most, most health and safety management systems are designed to suit the majority of the workforce. So that's your neurotypicals. And they don't flex to accommodate workers with disabilities or, or and, and look, people with, with ADHD often don't consider themselves as having a disability, so they wouldn't necessarily think to disclose it as such. But in the workplace, it tends to be seen more as um, if it is disclosed, it's viewed more as a HR challenge, something, you know, HR needs to make reasonable adjustments, which often means just giving them a pair of noise cancelling headphones, because that's what we did with the last guy. But, you know, in, in lots of roles, that's not necessary. It doesn't help everybody. It certainly doesn't address the majority of the safety challenges. Yeah, and that's one of the things that you, I think you've uh, made a, a significant point about that, like workplace accommodations is beyond noise canceling headphones. Absolutely, yeah. Um, just to circle back for, for listeners who might be interested, uh, the, uh, the episode of On Being was episode 1030. Uh, with Trabian Shorters. Uh, the episode's oh, called a, uh, a Cognitive Skill to Magnify Humanity. Definitely worth worth checking out. Sounds fascinating. Yeah. So let's do this. Let's actually take a quick break here. And uh, when we come back, let's get into some of the, the, the discoveries that you made, both through your research and then also as you're trying to do this this work, so we can figure out how do we make work a safer place for everyone. So we will be right back. Since 2014, ADHD Rewire has been helping people grow through community and nothing embodies us more than our 10 week intensive coaching and accountability groups with 800 alumni who have gone through one of 66 groups over the course of 27 seasons. One thing is for certain, we can do hard things and we don't have to do them alone. Being misunderstood by others or not understanding ourselves can be so painful because I have been there too. And I created ADHD Rewired because I don't want people to feel alone, helpless, or hopeless. We know that ADHD is real. Its challenges are real because we live it every day. 
And what we can do is make positive changes in our lives because we are absolutely capable and we don't have to make those changes on our own. So if you want to join the coaching group built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD, then head over to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our summer group interest list. Even if you signed up to show your interest for previous seasons, come back to coachingrewired.com so you can get notified when our summer registration kickoff event will start. That's coachingrewired.com. Support for this podcast comes from Adult Study Hall. Get more done with the virtual co-working community built for adults with ADHD by adults with ADHD by going to adultstudyhall.com. From our weekly guided and facilitated sessions to our 24-7 drop-in room, there are plenty of ways you can optimize your productivity to get more done using real-time accountability. It's only $19.99 a month, and it's free for the first week to try, and you can cancel your membership at any time. We have our themed and guided sessions, also known as our Ash Plus sessions, for writing, decluttering, working out, finances, and weekly check-ins. Then we also have a session for making progress on art and other personal projects, and a career-focused session led by our very own coach cat Boyer. then this thursday at 12 p.m central joy is that this thursday yeah it will be the 21st huh mm-hmm. wow then this Thursday at 12 p.m. Central, join me in our monthly Ash Plus Palmadero Dance Party. That's this Thursday, April 21st at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. If you make it on time, we'll kick it off with a five-minute dance party warm-up. Then we'll work for two 50-minute work blocks with 10-minute dance breaks in between. Dancing is required. If your environment and body allow, dance skills are not. If you want to join the virtual co-working community created just for us, we'd love to have you. Go now to adultstudyhall.com to get signed up. It's free for the first week, then only $19.99 a month after that. That's adultstudyhall.com. And uh, for new members, uh, they, when they jump into uh, Ash 24-7, you're going to greet them and say hello because you, you welcome everyone. Uh, I sure am. Come and say hi. So if you have any questions, uh, say hi to Lisa. She's uh, she's happy to help. And uh, she'll be there working here at ADHD Rewire Headquarters. That's AD, uh, what's, what's the website? That's adultstudyhall.com. <laughs> and we are back. So Catherine, when uh, you were kind of doing this research and, and discovering that there is no information out there. There's no research out there that's talking that's about right. how can employers actually support people with ADHD. It was, was it during this time you also discovered that the more you're learning about ADHD, you're like, this actually sounds really <laughs> familiar. It was actually. So it was, look, I was actually at a fairly difficult point in my own life when all this was going on because um, I had uh, a few years before lost my my husband. I was widowed and I realized I hadn't dealt with that grief. Um, it was sudden. There was a lot of trauma that I needed to process before I could start processing the grief. And so I was working with a psychologist doing lots of really good reflective work, mindfulness, meditation, processing all of this. And I guess really paying attention to what was going on inside my own mind and my own body. I was doing this work even before I worked with this client. So as I started doing this research and reading about ADHD, I started to recognize some things in myself, some behaviors and some functioning within myself that had always been there. It's just that now that I, I was being more mindful in the way, in what I was doing, I was becoming more aware of it myself. I started to think, you know, I, what do they call it? Is it frequency illusion when you de you decide you want to buy a particular make and model of car and all of a sudden you're seeing them everywhere? Yes. I thought, have I got this going on for myself? I'm just researching ADHD now and I'm imagining all of these things in myself. But I knew there were some challenges that I had. For example, a really awful working memory. People could say something to me and it would be gone in 30 seconds unless I wrote it down. And I started to worry, actually, that maybe I had the early onset dementia then I thought, well, no, I've always been this way. Um, my memory's always been rubbish. You know, I, I um, hyper-focused, really obsessing on a particular interest to the exclusion of everything else and anything that bores me, I just can't pay attention to it at all. 
So I actually spoke to my psychologist about this and said, look, you're going to think I'm crazy here, but there's things going on in me that I don't think can be explained by grief and trauma. And it's always been there. It's always been like this. I'm wondering, because I'm doing this work on ADHD now, whether it is this, but it seems ridiculous that a woman of my age, like I was 54 at the time, you know, isn't this just a childhood thing? So we arranged for me to go off and get tested. And a few weeks later, sure enough, the diagnosis came back that I have combined type ADHD. And so I started medication and working with a really good coach, an ADHD coach. And I have to say it was, it really has been life-changing for me in the most positive way. I mean, apart from the changes that I've experienced in my own personal life, it's changed my whole outlook on how I work and the type of work that I do and the need for this work to be done with employers to educate employers around not just the challenges around keeping ADHD and other neurodivergent workers safe at work, but the enormous benefits and strengths and talents that they bring that really can give employers a competitive advantage as, as many other employers are finding out. So how are you getting this information into places of employment for the leaders and for management to really uh, to understand this and not just as a, you know, an acceptance campaign, mm. right? It's like, we don't want, yeah. this, we don't want acceptance, but we want, we don't is, want tolerance. Right. Exactly. We, <laughs> like, it, it, like integrate us. We are exactly. part. Yes. Exactly. So, exactly. so how, how, what's the reception been? Look, mixed, I have to be honest, it's still early days yet, Eric. So I've launched the Neurodiverse Safe Work Initiative. I've established um, an advi a technical advisory board to work with me on that because I recognize that I don't know or understand all of the issues and I certainly don't have all the answers. So I have an occupational physician, an occupational psychologist, an ADHD coach, a couple of other occupation professionals with lived experience of, of ADHD, a highly skilled uh, investigator, so I have a group of people advising me and um, essentially what I'm doing is a lot of promotional work at the moment. Uh, I've actually produced um, an ebook called An Employer's Guide to ADHD Safe, ADHD Safe Work, which is available for free download from my website. And any, any opportunities like this, I have Eric to speak either on podcasts or webinars um, to get the word out as much as possible. We've also established uh, a couple of private Facebook groups. So I have the ADHD Safe Worker Group and the ADHD Safe Work Employer Group, which are private spaces for both workers and employers in separate forums to come together privately to share their experiences, ideas, to seek advice and support from others. I guess at this stage, I'm really just trying to get the conversation going. That, that ebook sounds really valuable. The uh, what, is it, what is it at the the Lethbridge uh, LethbridgePiper.com.au. Yeah. Okay, great, great. So yeah. check that out. That sounds like a really uh, fantastic resource. And I will be producing more um, over the coming months um, for, for autism and other neurodivergent conditions as well. So talk to me more about some of the the reception. You know, can you share a couple of stories with us as yeah you've been approaching companies? So, yeah, well, I mean, if I go back to the original case study, Kyle, for him, and I could use this to illustrate the two um, approaches that I recommend employers adopt. First of all, is considering expanding the scope of their safety management system. Now, there are international standards, well, there is a particular international standard around safety, safety management systems that uses inclusive language. It talks about your safety management system is there for workers. You need to consider the needs of workers. It doesn't say only your neurotypical workers. So workers means all workers, right? So employers often don't, don't realize that that means workers with neurodivergent conditions and disabilities. So we need to be more flexible. So to give you an example with the Kyle case study, the advice I gave to the employer there was, first of all, they needed to rewrite that drug and alcohol policy. They needed to expand the scope of it. They needed to consult with their workers. They needed to let workers know that there was a mechanism by which they could safely disclose any medications that they were taking that could show up on a drug screen and that that wouldn't mean that they would lose their job. It may mean that there would be a referral to, for example, an occupational physician or someone like myself to give advice about how to support them and keep them safe at work so that workers would feel would start to feel safe about disclosing this. 
The other advice I gave was that the employer needed to revise all of their policies and procedures around consulting with workers. So they consult more broadly with a broader range of workers, not just the same old people that keep turning up for safety committee meetings, the ones that are really interested. Expand the scope, find different ways to consult with people. Not all workers like to sit in a safety meeting for an hour and work through an agenda. There are other ways to talk to people and to get their input into your policies and your systems development. The third thing um, that I advised this client was to think more broadly about how you manage risk. Revise your risk management policies and procedures because Workers with ADHD perceive and respond to risk differently. Hazard in the workplace or risk in the workplace may be perceived quite differently by somebody with with ADHD. Noises, for example, the busyness in the environment can be enormously distracting for people with ADHD. Not only that, there are the internal distractions that people live with as well that can affect their ability to concentrate and focus. And if you're working in a task or in a high-risk industry where concentration is critical, then you need, as an employer, to create the environment and the conditions where that worker is able to concentrate and work safely. So it sounds like, because I think when we um, hear the phrase workplace safety, I think we're thinking of physical safety. Well, it's, yeah, and it's not just that, is it? Right, so, and I think this maybe is becoming more accepted, uh, the just how important psychological safety is in the workplace. Because, you know, without psychological safety, you know, you can't build effective teams. It really dampers both creativity and vulnerability and people's willingness to to really contribute. Mm, Exactly. And I think, you know, if, if you think about the rejection sensitivity that's often very common for people with ADHD, if you put that in an employment context, both from the worker's point of view and say a supervisor's point of view, if you're a worker with ADHD and you know your performance review is coming up, it's quite likely you're going to ruminate and stress about that for weeks because you're going to be completely convinced you're going to be getting negative performance feedback and you're going to worry about it. And that's going to impact the way you communicate with others. It's going to affect your sleep which will lead to more fatigue. And we already know that people with ADHD, 80% of people with ADHD have a delayed circadian rhythm or some other sleep disorder, which if you're fatigued, working in a high risk environment can create further challenges. The emotional dysregulation that goes with ADHD can have an enormous impact on relationships and functioning at work. Likewise, if you're a supervisor or a manager or a leader with ADHD, it can impact the way you relate with your team and with others. If you're inclined to hyper-focus. Will will you hyper-focus on a particular worker who perhaps isn't performing in the way that you like? Will you stress about that conversation that you need to have? Will you blurt something out because you're impulsive? You say something that's maybe inappropriate. Then are you likely to be viewed as being a bully or intimidating in work where really maybe you just have not very well controlled ADHD? Mm -hmm. So maybe in this situation, and HR typically tends to get involved in these situations and deal with it as a performance management issue. And typically then the person, you know, you're told you can't behave like this in the workplace or you need to work harder, you need to try harder, you need to pay attention. We're going to give you a warning, which of course makes the worker more stressed, which makes the symptoms worse. But this is what I've coined, the expression I've coined is the vicious cycle of non-disclosure. Okay, mm. if, if we don't disclose, and I'm not saying for one minute, I'm not advocating for one minute that every person with ADHD needs to stand up loud and proud and declare their ADHD in the public forum. Far from it. Um, the responsibility to create the environment in which all workers and any workers feel safe to be their authentic self at work is the employer's. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how many tips or tools or tricks we give the ADHD worker to be productive at work. They don't control the environment. It's the employer that controls the environment. You know, when I think about the different sort of avenues that this kind of information can come into a workplace, Mm. I'm thinking about that. There's so many different stakeholders, right? So whether someone is in a leadership position, whether they're, you know, in a C-suite or uh, management, right? There's still going to have to be some convincing to, to another body yeah. of why this is a good idea for the yeah. company. So if, if someone is feeling uh, courageous and wants to start to get this conversation going in the workplace, looking at various roles uh, in the workplace, what are some of the 
what are some of kind of the, maybe the, the bullet points of if you're presenting this to the, a, a team that may consider um, doing something like this, what are some of the key points you think are important to cover? Um, well, first of all, the extent of neurodivergence in the population, that this isn't just a rare childhood thing that pops up from time to time. Neurodivergent brains, we believe, and there's some research that suggests 30 to 40 percent of the world's population has some neurodivergent trait, whether that's ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia, dyscalculia, autism, and often they overlap. You can have more than one. Uh, Professor Amanda Kirby in the UK um, has talks about our spiky profiles rather than being on a spectrum where we all function differently and these overlay. And not only that, but about 50% of people have um, with ADHD have a comorbid mental health condition. So I guess the first message to employers and regulators is that neurodiversity means all of us. And neurodivergent functioning brains make up about 30 to 40 percent of the world's population. So most employers, I would argue every employer, if you look at statistically, probably 30 to 40 percent of your workforce is made up of neurodivergent functioning brains. That means if your management system is designed around neurotypical functioning, you're missing 30 to 40 percent of your workforce. And yet regulators, legislation, international standards require that your systems accommodate all workers. And so if I can play devil's advocate, so yeah. maybe someone on maybe the, the board says, well, like it's we're not a social service agency. We're here to, to provide profit for the, the mm. stockholders and to run a, an, an efficient business. What's the selling point for people who are maybe not as maybe empathetic towards different kinds of brains? So I would say in response to that, that many enlightened employers now are embracing neurodivergent workers. For example, JP Morgan Chase, they launched their neurodiversity program. They now employ, they've actively recruited neurodivergent workers. They now employ around 150 neurodivergent workers in, I think it's eight countries since 2015. I can't remember the exact percentages, but they I know they have a 99% retention rate of mm. their neurodivergent workers. Now, if you think about that in relation to the cost of employee turnover, right? If you're retaining 99% of your workers, then your recruitment costs are going to go down. And I think it was that neurodivergent workers are something like 48% more productive and 80% faster or 90% faster than neurotypical workers. Now, is that, when, is, is that when they are, have support or, or are you saying in general? In general, when they're brought in to work in particular roles, obviously that, that's their neurodivergent functioning. So my argument to boards and executives is stop looking at this as a problem that you have to manage and start looking at this as an opportunity that you can embrace that could potentially give you a strategic advantage. If you engage workers that are different, you're going to have different skills and abilities. So we know, for example, that neuro that, that ADHD workers are often highly creative, entrepreneurial, deeply empathetic, good communicators. They're funny. They're engaging and also sensitive. So if you're wanting to create a product or a service that you you want to provide services to a broad range of society that is 30 to 40 percent neurodivergent, then if you're producing products, don't you want those products to be accessible to a broader audience? If you're going to do that, you need to, it to be about to be developed by a broader range of workers. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to pick up right where we left off because I want to talk to you a little bit about some ideas around universal design. So we will be right back. If you like ADHD Rewired, then be sure to check out all of our other shows we have on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. We have ADHD Essentials, Hacking Your ADHD, and ADHD Diversified. The ADHD Friendly Lifestyle is actually no longer a part of the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network, but you can still find all of Moira's stuff on her podcast feed. She's now going to be doing her own thing. So we wish her the very best of luck. 
You can join us every second Tuesday of the month for our live Q&A. You can register for that at ADHDBewire.com slash events. You can join us live on Zoom. That's every second Tuesday of the month at 1030 a.m. Pacific, 130 p.m. Eastern. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review. Share it with a friend. Do you have any friends or family in your life that might have ADHD? Oh, I'm sure I do. You know, if you share an episode with them from Apple Podcasts and they use Apple Podcasts, it will actually show up on their podcast player. It will say shared by Lisa, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. And, and they're, very convenient. Yeah. It's like right where it's that's right at the point of performance. Discover more from ADHD Rewired by going to ADHDrewired.com. Click on the podcast tab at the top to see our other podcasts. Click on the events tab to register for our live Q&A. All of it is at ADHDrewired.com. And thanks for listening. All right, we are back with Catherine Lee. So, I've, I've often had this idea around um, with companies, if they can tap into a pool of people who have ADHD to test their products, to test their services, especially in technology, because I feel if people with ADHD find something easy to use, um, that most people, are, I think, are going to to find it easy to use. Because I think if yeah, you look yeah. at what makes a good, you know, as far as like a user experience design, I think a lot of that has to do with how many executive functions are, are being taxed to yeah. uh, engage with this product or service. Yes. So yes, exactly. I think it would be a reasonable argument to say, well, if we, if you understand that piece from a business to consumer, this will also be helpful in the realm of how do we also take that same idea with our employees? Yeah. So if you, you want to service a pr provide a service or a product to a broad range of society, then it needs to be as accommodating for as many people as possible. It needs to be flexible. You need as many people to have input into the design of that. You need creative thinkers. You need big picture thinkers. You need people with good technical skills and entrepreneurial skills. There are huge advantages for employers in attracting a broad, diverse workforce. But we need to keep those people safe. We need to also understand that the very advantages, that the, the functioning that is so advantageous to the employer also means that that worker may perceive risks and experience risks and hazards differently in the workplace. And therefore, the employer needs to adapt their systems and make them more accessible. So we've talked about consultation and communication Training. I mean, not everybody can sit in a room to go through a safety critical training program for an hour on a PowerPoint talk and talk presentation. So let's make that training more accessible. Is it best if we break this up into small components? Do you just want to go for a walk and talk about this? Because some people need to move their body when they learn in order to learn. So it's about being flexible around our systems to, to create an environment where they can be productive and safe. I wonder when, if you were to ask your, you know, just a typical employee, how do you learn best? I wonder if they really know. Well, we don't know. And maybe it's just a case of trial and error. What we need to not have happen though, which is what I've seen in the past, is a worker sits through the training, can't absorb the information because it's not particularly interested in them, but their employer is saying, look, this is a safety critical component of your role. And we're going to do a competency assessment. And if you can't pass the competency assessment, I'm afraid you go, you, we can't keep you employed in this role to do this job. And all, all so, it's testing is how well do you take this test? Yeah. So is there a better way? Can we support the worker in learning this information by actually showing them, you know, doing it on the job, buddying up with someone, talking Rather than sitting down and reading this safety data sheet or running through it section by section, can we just talk about it? Can we talk about when, what safety gear you need to wear and when you need to wear it and how you need to wear it and why you need to wear it? Illustrate that in the workplace rather than sit and do the chalk and talk. Uh, it's about being more, more accepting of people's difference, I think. Where do you see the Neurodiverse Safe Work Initiative going? Oh, it's, as I said, it's early days yet. My, my, objective really is to bring this message to as many employers as possible, obviously through education, journal articles. I, I would like to um, work with regulators as well so that regulators are thinking more broadly around, um, you know, if they're conducting an investigation into an incident that occurred, was there an element of neurodiversity at play here? Was a contributing factor to this worker's injury the fact that they 
they, they function neurodivergent, they're ADHD or autism there, and, and that was a contributing factor, not to apportion blame, but to understand so that the employer and the regulator in future can change the environment so this doesn't affect other people in the future. But also working with individuals. So no matter how flexible you make your management system, there may always be individuals who at times are outliers, that the, the system can't adapt. And so we need to create what I call a neurodiverse safe work plan for that individual, where instead of the say the ADHD worker working with their doctor and their psychologist and their coach to be productive, tips and tools to be productive at work so they can function and be a good worker. Why doesn't the employer hop on board the worker's support team and become part of their support team? So the employer or the employer's representative is engaging with the worker's ADHD coach. The ADHD coach could be welcomed into the work environment working with their psychologist, working with their doctor. So everybody is on the, on the same page to understand how this worker's condition affects them and how they can get the best out of the worker at work and keep them safe. Everybody's on the same page. You know, um, earlier in the year, uh, Jessica McCabe and I, we were exploring doing a, uh, this, this uh, world summit of the ADHD friendly world summit. Um, right. actually, the plans are on pause right now for other projects, uh, but right. we haven't forgotten it. Um, but sort of the, the tagline that, that uh, she came up with was an ADHD friendly world is an everybody friendly world. And I think that's, oh, right. that can so apply to the workplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? It's, it's, uh, it's a great tagline. And it's so true. I mean, we're not looking for neurodivergent workers to be just tolerated and put up with. You know, it doesn't have to be a problem. It, it's, we, we are all the same in one respect, and that is that we are all different. Everybody's different. There is no such thing as a normal person. And just as everybody's bodies are different, everybody's brains are different. We just need to be more appreciative and understanding and, and accept and embrace that difference. Find the benefit in it. Well, Catherine, I appreciate all the work that you are doing in this space. Thanks, Eric. Would you let everyone know uh, one more time your, your website? Yes. So it's www.lethbridge, that's L-E-T-H-B-R-I-D-G-E, Lethbridge Piper. Dot com dot au. And again, we will link that URL in uh, the, the uh, show notes for this episode. Thanks. Catherine Lee, thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us. I think what you're doing is fantastic. And uh, I would love to have you back on in you know, a year or two and tell, them, tell us that you've uh, made huge strides and now you're going global. <laughs> Watch this space. I, I would be delighted to come back and tell you that, Eric. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you so, so much, much for having me. It's been a great privilege. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader 
would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person, and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. Atomic Habits by James Clear. The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni. Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer. The Body Keeps Score by Bessel van der Kolk. Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang. The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. Make It Stick. The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown. The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey. Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris. Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.